Hi, I'm Julian Frost, N3JF, and this is... Nancy Bennett, KK4WCC. And we're in Stewart, Florida, where we're trying to get Nancy up on the air on HF. Unfortunately, Nancy lives in a community with incredible antenna restrictions. So, we're going to show you how we get a huge antenna in a tiny little attic space and get Nancy up on HF. So, follow us. Many of us know John Amodeo, NN6JA, as the producer of ABC's hit comedy, Last Man Standing. You may also know that on Last Man Standing, Tim Allen plays Mike Baxter, who has the fictitious call KA0XTT. Tim Allen, the actor, is also a ham in real life, and the show uses real ham gear on the set, all of which is operational, including the antenna farm on the studio roof. John and Nancy have been friends for many years, and when Nancy got her technician ticket and then quickly upgraded to general, John was very happy that she had joined the great ham radio community. As hams, we all want the best antennas possible, but many of us live in antenna-restricted communities, and that was the problem Nancy was now facing. Her community in Stewart, southeastern Florida, is governed by a homeowners association. The streets are clean, the pond is filled with fish and concrete ducks, the lawns are beautifully manicured and are enjoyed by both the residents and the local wildlife. But as is typical with all HOAs, there are restrictions, lots of restrictions. Nancy, KK4WCC, has a nice little station consisting of an ICOM IC7100 with a Heil ICM microphone into a Daiwa CN801HP. She made several attempts to get permission from her homeowners association to put up a simple vertical antenna in her backyard. No luck. The homeowners association said no. No antennas of any kind, period. She was stuck. For the last man standing station, John selected a number of Comet antennas for the stage roof. For VHF and UHF, they use GP1 and GP3 dual-band verticals, and for HF, they use an H422 rotatable dipole. John commented that the Comet H422 works well right out of the box, and then he added, let's put a full-size H422 in Nancy's tiny attic. John and I both live on the west coast, 2,300 miles from Nancy, a minor detail. The real problem was Nancy's attic. It's only 23 feet long and very cramped. The biggest problem, though, was the length of the H422. It's over 33 feet long. John came up with an idea. A cunning plan that could solve the problem. Rather than use the end 40 meter elements, we'd use the equivalent lengths of wire. In that way, we could arrange the wire at whatever angles necessary to fit the antenna in the cramped attic space. To tune the antenna, we knew we'd have to physically cut the aluminum tubing and shorten the sections. We modified the antenna in Los Angeles and shipped it, along with some coax, to Florida, where Daryl, KW4LG, did the initial install. The antenna just fit, with no room to spare. We did it. We got an antenna that's this big, into a space this small. Daryl did an initial SWR sweep, which showed promise on all of its four bands. Although on each band, its resonant frequency was low, the antenna would need tuning. Frequent flyer miles came to the rescue. John and I flew in from the west coast and met with Nancy and Daryl, and we began a full day of antenna tuning. We ran 75 feet of new LMR400 from ABR Industries, from the station to the antenna. After trimming the antenna's aluminum tubing and tweaking the lengths of wire at the insulators at both ends, we achieved some pretty respectable readings across the bands. Because the bandwidth was narrow, we added an LDG RT100 remote tuner at the feed point. Thanks to Daryl, Nancy already had an existing Comet dual band VHF and UHF antenna in the attic for local repeater and D-Star use. John and I spent some time with Nancy showing her how to use all of her new gear. John showed Nancy how she could easily program her IC7100's memories using the programming software from RT Systems. Signals from all around the country were suddenly booming in. Almost as soon as we finished, Nancy was on the air, making contacts in Europe and beyond. Whiskey Charlie Charlie. Before we left Florida, Nancy organized an eyeball QSO with members from several local amateur radio clubs. Over sandwiches and icy beverages, John spoke about how, along with Daryl's help, 
we transformed a once very limited station into one that's a joy to use. Very strong signal. It's receiving like gangbusters. You can hear stations from all over the world. The first contact on that radio was Mexico, and the second contact was France. And it was a uh, 5'7", maybe. Uh, he was 20 over. And, you know, the people were coming in yesterday all day long, banging in on 20 and 40 meters. Uh, oh, I should have went on the yeah. radio. I mean, really, really, really <laughs> strong signal. So to the other hams in the community, John explained how an antenna could be placed off the community grounds if you didn't mind pushing your luck with the homeowners association. If you want to get into a battle with your homeowners association, you could just start pushing the envelope of that. You know, you just start putting up antennas and see how aggressive they are. Like we think the preserve out there, which is not a part of this community, and they pay an association fee and they manage it, but inside that preserve is owned by the state. So technically, you could go back there and put a vertical. Yeah bury a, a coax, you know, make a little ditch witch, bury a coax to connect to them, and they could not say anything about it. Now, I'm sure you'd get into an argument with them about it, but you could do it. They may call the state. As for Nancy, she is now happily working the world on HF. Whiskey Charlie Charlie. Not bad for an antenna crammed into an attic only 12 feet above the ground. What's more, there are no visible antennas on her house or in her backyard. She has a great station and no CCNR rules were broken. This was just one way to get on the air in an antenna restricted community. If you find yourself in a similar situation, we encourage you to never give up, never surrender.